and gentlemen, welcome to the first and also the last lecture of the Mama Charitable Foundation Visiting Professor in Buddhist Studies Lecture Series 2013. Today's topic is Buddhism and the issue of religious fundamentalism. We are very honored to have invited the first Mama Charitable Foundation Visiting Professor in Buddhist Studies, Professor Y. Karuna Dasa. Without further delay, let's welcome Professor, please. Yes, today we come to the third of the lecture series uh, under the, held under the aegis of the Mahama Charitable Foundation. So as you all know that today's topic is Buddhism and the issue of religious fundamentalism. This is a very important issue because now the fundamentalism is sweeping through the world, all over the world, religious fundamentals. So it merits our attention. So my purpose is to say how Buddhism sees this problem of religious fundamentalism. First, what is fundamentalism? The term fundamentalism in a technical sense was first used in North America in the early decades of the 20th century. It was used by a Protestant Christian movement to refer to their commitment to the fundamental teachings of Buddhism. It was used by a yes. This movement arose as a reaction against the secularization of society due to the impact of science and technology. The movement wanted to preserve and consolidate the Christian worldview against the emerging scientific world, particularly the Darwinian theory of evolution, it became a big challenge to the Christian doctrine of divine creation. Uh, this is not the only occasion where science and religion came into a confrontation. About centuries earlier, Galileo, he said that uh, uh, it is not the, it is not the, uh, the it is not the sun, but the earth is rotating. Uh, so, so there was a heresy case against him. He had to recant what he said. Uh, so this is the second location that uh, this thing happened. Then, what is fundamentalism? Yes. But now the term fundamentalism is used in a very wider sense by sociologists and philosophers of religion as an umbrella term to embrace all religious phenomena and movements which have emerged as a reaction against some kind of perceived danger, as for instance, the marginalization of religion due to the secularization of society with the onset of science and technology. Now I come to the main features, main features of religious fundamentalism. Now according to this book, Fundamentalism comprehended an anthology of articles edited by Martin E. Marty and R. Scott Appleby. Some of the basic ingredients that go to make religious fundamentalism are as follows. 1. Ultra-orthodoxy. The recognition of the absolute accuracy, the inerrancy of the religious scriptures based on almost on a very literal interpretation of what the religious scriptures see. So they don't like the modern science of hermeneutics which seek to understand text not in a literal sense but the, all these uh, orthodox sects try to understand books text in a very literal sense. Ultra orthodox, second one. Ultra orthopraxis, that is the practice of religious life strictly according to the religious rules and regulations. Next. Then millennialism, the belief that history has a miraculous culmination when the good will eventually triumph over evil. This idea has no correspondent view in Buddhism because Buddhism is not concerned with uh, <laughs> Buddhism is concerned only with cosmology. Cosmology means the map of the world, the geography of the world, but not with cosmogony. Cosmogony is the history of the world, how the world began, how it will end up. Those are cosmogonical questions which Buddhism keeps itself away from. So this idea of millennialism does not come to Buddhism. Next one. Other one is Messiah. 
the belief in a messiah or savior an all powerful mediator who will usher in the ideal spiritual society uh, we don't have this idea of a messiah as well in buddhism because the buddha is not a messiah he is a human being who through his own human effort became enlightened without any divine intervention without any divine grace is this then militant piety you will notice that these two terms won't go what is militant cannot be pious what is pious cannot be militant so the very two expressions are contradictory this shows the contradictory nature of fundamentals militant piety yes next one exclusiveness and parentism exclusiveness and we only we are right all others are wrong that's exclusiveness and parentism and the resulting fanatic tendencies yes next then we come to other sources of fundamentalism religion is not the only source of fundamentalism fundamentalism could arise in relation to one's own race ethnicity culture even political ideology as well as language however our discuss here yeah, religious prejudice now we come to the earlier manifestations of religious fundamentalism although the term religious fundamentalism is of recent origin the idea of religious fundamentalism is certainly not new it was there earlier as well we should not forget that ideas can exist without formal terms and labels attached to them yes. one example is the inquisition initiated by the catholic church in the during the medieval period the inquisition an earlier phase of christian fundamentalism can be seen in the inquisition which was initiated by the roman catholic church it started in the 12th century france its aim was to fight against heretics the followers within the church who held non orthodox views views that did not conform to yes now uh, i must elaborate on this word heretics and her- heresy in buddhism we don't have two words corresponding to heresy and heretics the the word tittaka is has been wrongly translated by modern scholars as heretics tittaka does not mean heretics tittaka mean a fraud fraud maker or even buddha is a tittaka it for you make a fraud to cross over the other side of the river from this world to the, to the world of bondage to the world of freedom so it's that's what it means even buddha can be a tittaka tittaka fraud maker so this anyatitya in buddhism does not mean the other heretics absolutely wrong that's to misinterpret buddhism buddhism never uses the word heretics the word uh, tittaka come from tit ford 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 is the place from where you take the boat the other side so all these religious teachers are making the ford for people to cross over from this show to the other show from samsara to nibbana yes then second one then there were the crusades a series of wars launched by the christian states of europe against the muslims between 1095 and 1291 yes then we come to interreligious and intrareligious fundamentalism religious fundamentalism could arise in one of two ways either between two or more different religions that is called interreligious or it can arise between two or more sects of the same religion that's interreligious a good example for the second kind of fundamentalism that is interreligious fundamentalism is the fundamentalist religious movement that arose among the more conservative site muslims against the secularized site muslims and later again the sunni muslims today in the media you always see the struggle between the two sects sunni and site muslim yes 
Now we come to the root cause of religious fundamentalism, exclusivism. There can be many reasons for the emergence of prevalence of religious fundamentalism. Nevertheless, modern philosophers of religion identify exclusivism as the root cause of religious fundamentalism. Yes. Now we come to the very comprehensive definition of exclusivism given by the Buddha himself. The most comprehensive and therefore the most acceptable definition of exclusivism can be found in the, in the teachings of the Buddha. It is, it is the dogmatic attachment to one's own view saying this alone is true, all else is false. This alone is true. All else is false. In Pali it is called idam satcha vinivis, that is adherent to one's own view, world view, dogma or ideology with strong tenacity. It is also called sanditi raga, that is to be infatuated with the rightness of one's own view. So these definitions of exclusivism are more scientific than what is presented today. They are extremely complete accurate and precise. Yes, please. Sorry, but the, about exclusivism, I must say, uh, there's also the idea of, is there's an identity crisis. A religion does not like to lose its identity. So another reason for exclusivism is to retain their identity. Now we come to, yes, next problem. How exclusivism manifests? It is in fact this kind of woke mindset that provides a fertile ground for bigotry and dogmatism and for overbearing self-opinionated stances and equally self-opinionated arguments in justifying them. Yes. Its external manifestations as we all know, are acts of fanaticism due to militant piety, indoctrination, unethical conversion, religious fundamentalism and religious persecution, not to speak of interpersonal conflicts, or often lead into internecine warfare. Yes, this is very important. I must emphasize that. Attachment to views, according to Buddhism, is more dangerous than attachment to material objects. From the Buddhist perspective, therefore, dogmatic attachment to views and ideologies, even if they are right, I must emphasize that, even if the view is right, is very much more detrimental and fraught with more danger than our excessive dis attachment to material things. A good example for this is today's fast-growing practice of suicide bombing. A person committing the act of suicide bombing is prepared to sacrifice his own life for the sake of the agenda he is pursuing. But if a person wants to steal another's property out of greed, he will never he will kill others, but he will never kill himself. So this this a person who is pursuing an ideological agenda is prepared to sacrifice his own life for that. We, we often hear this in the newspapers and other media today. Then I come to another non-religious ideological fundamentalism. Another good example of dogmatic attachment to ideologies is the Cold War between America and Russia, which began after the end of the Second World War and continued after the collapse of communism in Russia. It was, it was a conflict for supremacy between two political ideologies, between capitalism and communism, between individualism and socialism. The Cold War, as we all know, brought the whole world almost to the brink of a nuclear disaster. Uh, the, the struggle between capitalism and uh, communism was carried, out, carried on with religious fervor. With religious, they are also they have become two religious ideologies. Even today, I think, uh, capitalism and communism, they have become almost two religious ideologies more than two political ideologies. Yes.
Then we come to absolutism and fundamentalism. One major reason for religious or for that matter any kind of ideological fundamentalism is absolutism. Absolutism is best understood as the direct opposite of relativism. Buddhism distances itself from all forms of absolutism. Yes. This we can understand when we understand how Buddhism looks at views. For Buddhism, a view is not something absolute. Rather, a view is only a guide to action. A view is not some kind of icon to be ritually adulated, but a vehicle to be used. In his well-known discourse on the parable of the raft, the Buddha tells us that his teaching should be understood not as a goal in itself, but only as a means to the realization of of the goal, uh, realization of the goal. As a view, the Dhamma has only relative value, relative to the realization of the goal. As the Chinese Buddhist saying goes, the Dhamma is, is like a finger pointing to the moon. If we focus our attention only on the moon, we cannot see the moon. Nor can we see the moon without looking at the finger either. So, in a way, we can understand all different schools of Buddhist thought as different fingers pointing to the same moon. Uh, now, this is very important. We don't use this idea of view. Now, take even the word Mahayana, Hinayana. Mah Mahayana means not great view, but great vehicle. So, it reminds us of the Buddha's comparison of his Dharma to a raft. Mahayana means not great view great dogma or great ideology. It means great vehicle. Tantrayana, the tantra vehicle. Vajrayana, the vajra vehicle. So, the later Buddhists were also very careful not to use the word uh, view. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, what the Buddha told the Dhamma is only a description of actuality. Therefore, this description can be presented in many ways. The Dhamma is not the actuality as such, not the reality as such. Rather, it's a description of actuality. The Dhamma is a conceptual framework describing the actual nature of reality through the symbolic medium of language. Since the Dhamma is only a description, it, it follows that it can be presented in many different ways from many perspectives. In one discourse, the Buddha says that the Dhamma has been presented in many different ways, adopting many different perspectives. This happened when two disciples of Buddha, a layman and a monk had a unstoppable argument on the nature of uh, what is feelings. When the matter was about the Buddha, the Buddha said, both of you are correct. You are adopting two different perspectives. From one perspective, you can speak of two kinds of feeling. From another perspective, three. From another kind of six. From another perspective, eighteen. From another perspective, hundred and some, around hundred and sixteen, the Buddha said. It is on this occasion the Buddha said, I have presented my doctrine in different from through different perspectives, in many ways, adopting different perspectives. Yes. Accordingly, the Buddha says that one must not stick to one presentation and argue with another presentation, you know, another person who bases himself on another presentation. We often do that. If there are two, each presentation assumes meaning within its own context. So context is the guiding uh, guiding um, criteria. Yes. What this clearly demonstrates is that what is true and therefore what accords with actuality 
can be presented, can be described in many different ways. There is no one absolutist way of presenting the Dhamma which is valid for all times and class. This is very important. The Dhamma can be presented in many different ways because the Dhamma is only a description. It is not actuality, it is not reality. So, this, this must be clearly borne in mind when we are under, trying to understand the early Buddhist texts because sometimes different perspectives are adapted. Different perspectives do not represent different stages in the history of Buddhist thought. There are different perspectives only. Different perspectives can exist at one and the same time. They do not indicate a historical growth. The Dhamma is not a holy hymn or a sacred mantra. A holy hymn or a sacred mantra cannot be presented in many ways, nor can it be translated into some other language. Then we come to the question, why Buddhism does not have a holy language? If the Dhamma can be presented in many ways, it can also be communicated through many languages. When it was suggested to the Buddha by two of his disciples that the Dhamma should be rendered into the elitist, when it was suggested to, to the Buddha by two of his disciples that the Buddha Dhamma should be rendered into the elitist language of Sanskrit, the Buddha did not agree to the suggestion. The Buddha's attitude on this matter is that each person has the liberty to adapt his own dialect or language in understanding the Dhamma. This is precisely why Buddhism does not have a holy language. Now, I won't even... Now, what the Buddha taught can be presented in different ways, that is one. Other one is what the Buddha taught can be communicated through many languages. It is, it is these two factors that are responsible for the presence of a large number of doctrinal interpretations incorporated in three great Buddhist traditions of Theravada, Mahayana, Vajraya. And it also explains why what the Buddha taught came to be communicated through a large number of dialects and languages. Yes. Now we come the Buddhist, what is the Buddhist attitude to other religions? The Buddha refers to all other religions, religious, not teachers, teachers. The Buddha refers to all other religious teachers as Kamavadino. In a broad sense, Kamavadino means those who uphold the moral life. Because those who maintain that society should have a moral foundation. Buddha never questioned the sincerity of the religious teachers, the old religious teachers. There are hundreds of religious teachers due to the time of the Buddha. Their only aim is moral life. In that moral life. They, were, they, they had a moral agenda. So Buddha recognized that. That's why the Buddha calls them all Kamavadino. The Buddha as well as all other religious teachers are Kamavadino. Yes, that's right. Then we come to the four kinds of religion mentioned in the Buddhist texts. When it comes to other religions, Buddhism refers to four kinds of religion. One, a religion based on divine revelation, Anusava, that is all theistic religions which believe in a creator god like Christianity, Islam. They are theistic because they believe in a creator god. A religion based on divine revelation. Then a religion based on the claimed omniscience of the founder. The reference is to Jainism. Mahavira, the founder of Jainism, because Jaina Mahavira claimed to be omniscient. He said his doctrine is based on omniscience. If, if, the, if the teacher is omniscient, then all what he says should be correct. A religion based on the claimed, on the, on the, that's right, a religion, I use the word claim, because we don't know, allege, on the allege, the claimed omniscience of its founders, Abhanyuta. Fourth, third, a religion founded on logical and metaphysical speculation, Thakka Vimansa, that is on pure reasoning, you can develop a religion, on pure reasoning. 
through logic. Other one, a religion based on pragmatism with a skeptical or agnostic foundation, Amara Vikkeva. There were four religious teachers during this time who promulgated these four religions. A religion based on divine civilization, that is Brahmanism. A religion based on the claim of omniscience of the Jaina, that is Jaina Mahavira. The religion founded on logical and metaphysical speakers, there are many, uh, no, no names are mentioned. Then the last one, hmm, a religion based on pragmatism with the Sanjay Belatiputta, one of the six teachers. Sanjay Belatiputta was a skeptic. But in India, skepticism and religion go together, unlike in Greece, because uh, sometimes people adopt skepticism thinking that knowledge is a danger to liberation. Then other, you see, we cannot come to final knowledge because uh, with our limited uh, faculties, we cannot comprehend the unlimited universe. So they say it is better to suspend our judgment. It is a very advanced level of thinking. Actually, Vendabal Sariputta, Buddha's chief disciple, was first a disciple of the, the, this uh, Sanjay Velaktiputta. No, that, that, uh, that, uh, with that. Amara, you know, the skepticism, religion based on pragmatism. Venerable Sahari Buddha was first a pupil of uh, that religion, a follower of that religion, later he became a Buddhist. So they are all advanced religions. Next one, yes. Now this is important. The Buddha does not condemn any of these four religions as false. The Pali term for false view is Michadikti. When he says, what he says instead is that none of them are satisfactory. None of these religions are satisfactory. He never condemned them as wrong. Because Michadikti, uh, the Buddha never uses the word Michadikti to refer to any religious view. The only occasion the Buddha uses Michadikti is there only one. Materialism and other theories connected with materialism because materialism does not provide a proper foundation for the practice of not only Buddhist but any kind of religion. That was the Buddha's argument. Materialism fails to provide a rational foundation for the practice of moral life. The only materialism and theories connected with materialism are condemned as Michaditi, wrong view. Now we now Discusses and classes, we say the belief in a creator God is wrong. Buddha does not say that, it is we who say that. The belief in an immortal soul is wrong. It is we who say that. Buddha never said that. What the Buddha says is he keeps himself aloof from such views. Yes. Now, that, but now I come to the spiritual eternal Sasatavada. According to Buddhism, all religions that recognize something eternal, as for example an immortal soul or an creator God, come under spiritual eternalism. The Pali word is Sasatavada. Now, for that matter, all religions other than Buddhism come under eternalism. With Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Jewism, or any religion, take any religion. Past or present, Western or Eastern, all religions in the world, from the Buddhist perspective, are different forms of eternalism because they recognize the eternal, immortal soul or eternal God. Only, the only religion, the only exception is Buddhism. So Buddhism keeps itself aloof from all other religions. The only religion that does recognize an immortal soul or an eternal God. Nowhere does the Buddha describe any of these religions as upward in the wrong view, Michaditi. This does not mean that the Buddha recognized them as true religions. That does not mean that the Buddha recognized them. The reason for this is the method adopted by the Buddha in responding to all metaphysical views and ideologies. Yes. Now we come to a very important topic. The Buddhist psychology of ideologies. This is the method Buddha adopted in responding to other philosophical views. This, 
This method we would like to introduce as the Buddhist psychology of ideologies. It is the diagnosis of the origin of ideological positions by analyzing, by delving deep into their psychological mainsprings. The idea behind this is that our desires and expectations have a direct impact on what we choose to believe. Therefore, from the Buddhist perspective, all metaphysical and all theological views and ideologies are nothing but rationalization of our deep-seated desires and expectations. You might think that wrong views are due to ignorance. No, from the Buddhist perspective, all wrong views are not due to ignorance but due to greed, the desire. Now, from the Buddhist perspective, the belief in the immortal soul is the desire to establish your own self-identity and to eternalize your life, to, to eternalize your life into eternity. So that is the desire. So that is why in the in the first discourse of the Buddha, that's called the Brahma Jala Sutta, we find some 62 religious and philosophical views. 62, imagine some 62. Now here, none of these views are condemned as wrong. None of these views are accepted as true. All what the Buddha says, he says, these views arise purely due to psychological reasons. Due to the, these are the psychological reasons that lead to their emergence and prevalence. This is why people stick to them. That is, this is why it is difficult to get rid of them. Then the Buddha gives us a method how to not to reject them, but to how to transcend them, how to go beyond them to higher level. We can go to higher level where these views will not, not operate. So that is the Buddhist approach. That, this should explain why today, with all science and technology, still superstitions persist. Thousands of superstitious beliefs persist and many unscientific views believe because they will remain as long as there is greed in man. If they are due to ignorance, that ignorance can be rectified. Ignorance can be rectified. From the Buddhist perspective, all metaphysical views are due to the self-view. Self view, the belief in a separate self. Because when we have the self view, we have the egocentric perspective, the self centric perspective. We look at the world from that perspective, then the whole world appears because our self becomes the, uh, the point of reference. Our self becomes the point of reference. Everything is, that is why. Uh, the, the Buddhist idea is if you want to get rid of all these views, first you must get rid of the notion of the false wrong uh, self view. Yes, this is very important. I don't think any religion has this. As a religious teacher, the Buddha recognizes that all other religions have a right to exist. This is unique to Buddhism. I will give two. There are many examples, but I give two. We can give you at least two examples. As recorded in the Upali discourse of the Madhyamnika, one day a well known disciple of Nigandanatha Buddha, Nigandanatha Buddha is the founder of Jaina religion, his disciple had a long debate with the Buddha on the subject of karma. At the end of the debate, Upali was convinced that the Buddha was right. So he told the Buddha that he wanted to become. A disciple of the Buddha, yes. Then the Buddha said, You have been a long standing disciple of Nigandanatha Buddha. Therefore, it is proper for such well known people like you to investigate thoroughly before you make a decision. Eventually, however, Upali became a disciple of the Buddha. Then the Buddha told him, Householder, your family has long supported the Nigandanatha Buddha and his disciples. You should therefore provide him and his followers with arms and other requisites when they come to your home. So Buddha wanted to continue his earlier practice of providing arms and requisites to his former followers. Yes, that's... Next one. Then there's another... 
in the in the buddha's discourse to the sigala which i mentioned in the last lecture the buddha tells the buddha tells sigala that he should minister to the samanas and brahmanas in five ways by lovable deeds by lovable words by lovable thoughts by keeping the open by keeping open house for them by supplying them, them with their material needs now very important now what is most instructive to note here is the use of the word samana brahmana samana brahmana mean all religious teachers and their disciple not necessarily the buddha and his disciples so samana brahmana all religious teachers not only the book bhikkhus and the bhikkhunis and the buddha and the buddha disciple no samana brahmana yes now we come to a very very important question a burning issue today in theological discussions particularly the possibility of emancipation salvation outside buddhism there are many religions which assert that salvation is not possible outside their own religion i think i don't want to mention you know them the buddha is neither an incarnation of god nor is he the buddha prophet of god jesus christ is an incarnation of god muhammad is a prophet of god buddha is not like that the buddha is one who discovered the truth not one who has a monopoly of the truth this leaves open the possibility for others to discover the truth the buddhist idea of individual buddha but pacheka buddha in pali one who discovers the truth for himself is a clear admission of this fact pacheka buddha ideal shows that even individuals separately without listening to the doctrine of the buddha they can realize the truth and attain emancipation there is a very important this has not attracted the attention of many scholars i am quoting this as a matter of fact in the sutta nipata the buddha says i do not declare that all other samanas and brahmanas are sunk in birth and death yes but nahang i will quote the palu nahang sabbe samana brahmana se jati jaraya nyutati bhumi sutta nipata verse 1082 this is very very important statement we don't get this kind of statement in any other religion so buddha admits the possibility of salvation outside but yes next samana brahmana is the expression used by the buddha to mean all religious teachers and practitioners not necessarily the followers of the buddha this is a clear assertion of the possibility of emancipation outside buddhism nevertheless very important i must emphasize nevertheless this should not be understood as a blanket certificate issued by the buddha to validate all other religions what it clearly demonstrates is that truth is one but it is not the monopoly of the buddha others too can realize what it means that what the buddha discovered and realized others also can discover and realize by understanding the nature of reality in the same way as understood by the buddha himself it so this does not validate the validity of all other religions if religion believes in a eternal god or eternal hell that that kind of yeah that buddhism will not accept that yes it's wrong then we come to important buddhist pluralism as opposed to singularism what is pluralism another important reason why buddhism can avoid some kind of buddhist fundamentalism is what we want to introduce as buddhist pluralism yes please pluralism could be understood as the direct opposite of totalitarianism buddhist pluralism can be seen in many aspects of buddhist thought and practice yes i am giving examples of buddhist pluralism by referring you to different dimensions of buddhist thought and practice first pluralism in the concept of the buddha the very fact that the buddha is a discoverer should show us that the buddhahood is not the monopoly of one individual this is why 
Buddhism says that there had been many Buddhas in the remote past and that there will be many Buddhas in the distant future as well. Yes. Uh, this concept of Buddhahood is in contrast to the concept of Saviour in Christianity. For Christianity, Jesus Christ is the one and only divine Saviour. There will not be anyone. He is the final. He is the one and only Saviour for the whole world. Then, for Islam, Islam recognizes a large number of prophets. Even Buddha was a prophet according to Islam. All religious teachers previous to the Muhammad are prophets. But Prophet Muhammad did the last. There won't be any other prophet. The final prophet. He will be the final divine civilization. Yes. So this is what I want to say. When we consider the immensity of time and the vastness of space with billions of galactic systems within it, with the possibility of many kinds of living beings inhabiting them, to speak of one single saviour and to speak of one last prophet appears rather naive and parochial. I think you will agree with me. Yes, next. Then you come to Buddhist doctrinal pluralism. What the Buddha taught has given rise to a bewildering number of doctrines and doctrinal interpretation, which we find incorporated in the three main Buddhist traditions of Asia, Theravada in South Asia, Vajrayana in North Asia, and Mahayana in East Asia. There are two main reasons for this situation. One reason is that the Buddha has encouraged his disciples to elaborate the Dhamma. The Pali Tripitaka contains not only the teachings of the Buddha but many teachings of his disciples. Because uh, Buddha recognized the ability of his disciples to elaborate what he has taught. There are two main reasons for this situation. One reason is that the Buddha has encouraged his disciples to elaborate the Dhamma. The more one elaborates the Dhamma, the more it shines. The Buddha says, Vivato Virochati. The more you elaborate, the more you elaborate it, the more it shines. The other reason is this. Buddhism does not recognize an official interpretation of the doctrines. There are certain religions which say that the religion can be interpreted only by the by certain authorities, not by everyone. By everyone. So we don't have uh, a thing called an official interpretation of the Buddhist doctrines. Then in the whole Vinaya, you know, Vinaya means monastic rules, we never see any monastic rule which says that a Buddhist monk who misinterprets the Dhamma should be punished. No. I mean, not deliberately. A, a, a Buddhist but inadvertently, inadvertently, without being very knowledgeable, a Buddhist monk can misinterpret. But there is no punishment for him. The Vinay does not say because those are very human things. Yes. Next one. Then we find Buddhist scriptural pluralism. Buddhist scriptural pluralism is equally bewildering. There are four and not one only Buddhist canons. The Pali Buddhist canon, the Chinese Buddhist canon, the Tibetan Buddhist canon, and the Mongolian Buddhist canon. They are not, please remember, they are not translations into four different languages of one and the same Buddhist canon. Although, of course, they have many commonalities as well as differences. They are not one and the same script translated into four languages. Of course, they have many commonalities, that's a different. Next one, yes. This is in contrast to the religious scriptures of other religions, which have only one single scripture. Now, Judaism has only one text, the Old Testament. Christianity has only one text, the New Testament. The Quran has only one text. The Islam has only one text, the Quran. The Sikhi religion has only one book, Granth. It is true that some of these scripts such as the Bible and the Quran, have many translations into many languages. Nevertheless, we should not forget the fact that it is the same Bible or the same Quran that has been rendered into many languages. 
that is import yes next yes now i am i want to say something about this now people of the book people of the book this is an expression used in the quran to refer to the followers of the three abrahamic religions when abrahamic religions means judaism christianity islam do they all trace their ancestry to abraham the original founder of the israelite so they are also they are all three forms of monotheism all believe in in one creator god he is called jehovah or allah so people of the, so people of the book that this is very interesting this implies that other religions don't have a book like buddhist buddhism and hinduism they don't have book they are just uh, <laughs> that idea but what i want to see actually we have many more books not one so we should be referred to as people of the books in the plural people of the books yes yes please then you find buddhist cultural pluralism monoculturalism versus multiculturalism when it come to religious culture buddhism could be the most pluralistic religion in the world to whichever country buddhism was introduced buddhism did not level down its cultural diversity to create a monoculture the buddhist culture of china is different from the buddhist culture of japan and both from that of thailand or that of myanmar yes then this 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 is very important. buddhism is not a culture bound religion is very important thing. why because buddhism promotes cultural pluralism therefore buddhism does not become a culture bound religion what does this mean it means that just as a bird can fly from place to place leaving behind his cage even so buddhism can fl- fly from one place to another for instance from hong kong to america leaving behind his cultural baggage this is no this is not so in the case of some other religions as for instance hinduism and islam now a person in america can become a buddhist now without leaving without abandoning his usual dress his food his way of eating way of drinking he doesn't have to do anything then but if he becomes a muslim when he dies he can his body cannot be cremated it has to be buried then he can kind eat any kind of meat he will have to eat only halal meat but this question does not arise so this is why why buddhism is not a culture bound religion yes please that is why hinduism did not spread because hinduism is a culture bound religion hinduism went with with the hindus with the immigrants not as an idea when immigrants go from one place to another then they take their own religion that is how hinduism is spread but buddhism is un- very different then we come to very important buddhism and the pluralist buddhist cosmic perspective man and his place in the universe the buddhist view of the world universe is not confined to our earthly existence from its very beginning buddhism recognized the vastness of space and the immensity of time in one buddhist in one buddhist discourse we read yes this this is a, this, is a, this is a, is a direct translation as far as the suns and moons revolve shedding their light in space so far extends the thousand fold world system in it are a thousand suns a thousand moons thousands of earths and thousands of heavenly worlds this is said to be the thousand fold minor world system a thousand times such a thousand fold minor world system is the twice a thousand fold middling world system a thousand times such a twice a thousand middling world system is the thrice a thousand major world system no way in any of the Buddh- in india literature we get only in buddhism in no other religious texts in india we find this kind of description so in old in all cultures they always use sun and moon in the singular do they know only one sun and one moon i think it is only in buddhist books we get sun and the moon in the plural not one sun many more then the possibility of life here buddhism recognizes one pali comment says there is possible that even human beings are there out there because when the conditions evolve life can evolve to this yes 
Now these world systems are however never static. They are either in the process of expansion, vivattamana, or in the process of contraction, samvattamana. These cosmic processes take immensely long periods of time. They are measured in terms of years. Today we use the light years as the measurement. Those days, years. This side, next one. Then we find pluralism in the organization of the Buddhist monastic order. We can find Buddhist pluralism in the Buddhist Sangha organization as well. The Sangha is not a pyramid-like organization exhibiting an ascending hierarchical order where at the top you find the supreme head. It is not centralized but decentralized. The principle of organization is not perpendicular but horizontal. This allows for diversity within the Sangha community. It is these characteristics that makes it resilient. Resilient means it cannot break. The Sangha organization can be the oldest social organization in the world. It never, it never, it can bend, but it cannot break. That's what I mean by resilience. What is resilient can bend, cannot break. So, uh, I don't have to say, now there are three Sangha, the Mahayana Sangha, the Vajrayana Sangha, the Theravada Sangha, they are not, uh, oh, they are different, different traditions. That's quite good. There's nothing wrong in that. They don't have to follow the same pattern. Buddhism recognizes diversity. Yes, next one. Then the unity and the oneness of the humankind. This is also very important. Yes. Where Buddhism avoids pluralism is only when it comes to emphasize the unity and oneness of the humankind. The Buddha totally rejected the Brahmanical social hierarchy which was based on the four caste. Among the several arguments, among the, Buddha, among the Buddha's several arguments against the caste system, one of the most important is the biological. The Pali word Jati may mean biological, the biological argument. This biological argument begin by saying that different kinds of species such as the ants, the worms, the birds and four-footed animals have different biological differences. But when it comes to human beings, we cannot notice such biological differences. Now this from the Pali again, the Buddha himself says, not as he got their hair, head, head, ears, mouth, nose, lips, or brows, no as he got their neck, shoulders, belly, back, hip, breast, anus, or genitals, no as he got their hands, feet, palms, nails, and cows, are there any biological differences between two human beings? Vasetta Sutta or the Majjabunika. This Sutta is so important, it occurs in two places. In the Majjabunika as well as in Sutta Nipata, yes. Next part. And this, this is very interesting. This was a biological, biological argument. Another form of biological life. Addressing a Brahmin called Asalayana, the Buddha questions him. What do you think Asalayana? Suppose a mare were to be mated with a male donkey and a foal were to be born as a result, should the foal be called a horse after the mother or a donkey after the father? Why? <laughs> because because uh, the mother and father are of two different biologically different. Mother is biologically different from the father. Therefore, their product is also different. The fold is born. But a Brahmin, a high class woman marrying a low class man, will always get the, another human being, not a different kind of boy. That's why I say. Next one. Uh, then Asalayana uh, replies It's a mule master, Gautama, since he does not belong to either kind. Yeah, next one. This biological argument is also presented by the Buddhist sage Aswagosa in his Vajra Suchi, 1st century CE. Aswagosa says, the doctrine of the four castes is altogether false. All men are of one caste. Wonderful, you affirm that all men proceeded from one, that is Brahma, the creator God. How then can there be a fourfold inseparable diversity among them? If I have four sons, by one wife, the four sons having one father and one mother must all be 
all essential alike, nor too that distinctions of race among beings are broadly marked by differences of conformations and organizations. Thus, the foot of the elephant is very different from that of the horse, that of the tiger unlike that of the deer, and so of the rest. And by that single diagnosis, we learn that those animals belong to very different races. But I never heard that the foot of a Shastriya is different from that of a Brahmi or that of a Sudra. All men are formed alike and are clearly of one race. Yes. Then we come to Buddhist pluralism in the Buddhist social philosophy. Another important factor that helps Buddhists to distance themselves from religious fundamentalism is the liberalism and elasticity of the social philosophy of Buddhism. What we mean by this is that Buddhism does not interfere with the ways of living by imposing on us unnecessary restrictions. We never hear of a Buddhist dress, a Buddhist food or a Buddhist medicine which are valid for all times and climate because these are things that change from time to time, from place to place. Yes. Then what is the Buddhist attitude to marriage? There could be many forms of marriage. Monogamy, that is one man marrying one woman. Polygamy, one man marrying many women. Polyandry, many women marrying one, one man and so on. Today in the modern world, the legally recognized practice is monogamy. Nevertheless, Nowhere does Buddhism say that other forms of marriage are immoral. Because many forms of marriage can change from time. There is nothing very sacred about monogamy or polygamy. They are social practices. The Buddhism does not interfere with that. Yes. Yes. The form of marriage can change. If it changes, then there is no problem for Buddhism. For Buddhism, Marriage is only a social institution. It is something entirely mundane, not a religious sacrament. Nor does Buddhism say that marriage is an indissoluble bond. Therefore, if the two partners are incompatible, they can divorce, provided they follow the laws of the country. As in a, yes. Divorce is not a problem. Remarriage is not a problem. This, but according to... Yes. According to yes, next now according biggest problem is birth control. Now Catholic Church is against the birth control. Buddh, Buddhism is not again, Buddhism is not again the use of contraception to to stop breeding children. If 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 a couple decides to prevent children being born through contraception, that is their business. The Sangha will not interfere in that matter. The Sangha will not that's their business. But Yes, yes. But abortion is a different matter. But the abortion is a different matter. Since abortion involves taking of life, it goes against the first precept. However, in our opinion, this in my own opinion, if you don't agree, in my own opinion, even abortion can be condoned in cases of serious ill hazard. If abortion is the lesser evil, if abortion is the lesser evil, I think we can justify it from the Buddhist perspective. In this connection, it is instructive for us to remember two things. One, according to Buddhism, what really matters is volition, chetana. So when we do abortion, it is with a good chetana, good, good uh, volition. It is in fact volition that the Buddha has identified as karma. The other thing is more important. It is that the Buddha says in following morality, we should not cling to, cling, grasp morality, aparamatta. Even morality must not be grasped. If you do that, it becomes something artificial. Something artificial. Morality must be something spontaneous. Yes, please. Then disposal of the dead. How? There are many ways of disposing the dead body, such as burial, cremation, or mummification as in ancient Greek, Egypt. But the two main practices are burial and cremation today. Buddhism recognizes both. Muslims follow only the practice of burial, never cremation. Early Christians followed only the practice of burial, but now both Protestants and Catholics follow both methods. So, now there's another way I come. Some Buddhists today, uh, 
give the uh, they say after my death let the body be taken to for medical research that's a fast growing practice now but the muslim religion uh, islam does not like that because the body must be kept as it is but buddhism buddhism does not consider the dead body as something sacred you can make use of for medical research because that is abhedana because when you give your own body for medical research it is to increase the life span of others so it's a, it's for abhedana give life to others yes please then religious pluralism religious pluralism is based on the idea that all religions are but different manifestations this is not uh, yes yeah. all are different manifestations one and the same truth we find this idea for the first time in a hymn in the rigveda of ancient india truth is but one the wise people proclaim it in different ways this is the first ever statement uh, uh step what's called religious pluralism another religion that believes in religious pluralism is bahaism bahaism is the most modern religion it arose in iran in the 19th century but now it is not uh, the religion is not allowed to be practiced in iran it is is illegal um, to practice bahaism in iran because they thought it is a challenge to islam then we have another two movements we believe the theosophical society the theosophical society was established by a russian lady ladevsky and this american colonel olko the theosophical society they say all religions say the same thing then there is another thing called the perennial philosophy the continuous tradition they also say all religions are different idioms they say the same thing yes what both these two movements maintain is that despite the seeming differences all religions see the same thing and therefore it is possible to speak of a transcendental unity of religions a unity that transcends all apparent differences and all denominational and sectarian colorings yes in our view it is said is this kind of religious pluralism the answer to religious fundamentalism in our view it is certainly not for all those who speak of a religious pluralism or the transcendental unity of religion believe in a god or an impersonal godhead as the ultimate ground of existence buddhism does not subscribe to such a notion so we have to count out buddhism from what is called religious pluralism it's a it's a religious pluralism for those who believe only in some kind of higher reality we don't have such a idea in buddhism yes please then buddhism as religious inclusivism as a religion buddhism does not categorically assert that what is good and noble is confined to buddhism in this connection there's one statement which we find in a pali discourse as well as in a mahayana text yes this is the statement whatever is said by the buddha is well said whatever is well said is said by the buddha next one what the first sentence says is clear enough that's clear it is the second sentence that appears rather intriguing yes what the second sentence really says is that if there is anything well said no matter by whom no matter where no matter when it is also said by the buddha we have the liberty of elaborating this to mean that if there is anything well said whether it is in the bhagavad gita of hinduism or in the old testament of judaism or in the new testament of christianity or in the quran of islam or in the granth of sikhism in all these non buddhist religious scriptures as well as in all non religious even in all non religious works we do find the buddha word yes next we must not overlook the fact that it is only what is well said and certainly not what is ill said that we have to consider as the buddha word if a particular religious text approves killing of animals either for consumption or as a sacrifice to the god or gods then it is not what is it is not something well said then it is not said by the buddha yes then accordingly 
in relation to all that is well said buddhism means inclusivist in relation to all that is ill said buddhism means exclusivist then we got buddhism the first ever missionary religion in the world yes addressing his first 60 disciples who became arahants the buddha exhorted them go forth to monks and spread the dhamma for the good of the many for the weal of the many for the blessing of the many let not two of you go take the same path two of them must not get, go stay path because the urgency is the best you are wasting your time if two go on the same path you are wasting your resources yeah, that's so important this is how buddhism started as a missionary religion during the time of the buddha himself there is no historical evidence to suggest that any religious teacher during or before the time of the buddha resorted to missionary activity we can therefore conclude that buddhism is the first missionary religion in the world yes then the wheel of the dhamma dhamma chakra as a matter of fact the missionary spirit and the missionary thrust of buddhism can be seen in the very expression the wheel of the dhamma which we find in the title given to the very first sermon delivered by the buddha in benares its title is the setting in motion of the wheel of the dhamma it is in this sermon that we find the emphatic assertion it is said in the sutra the buddha set in motion the wheel of the dhamma which cannot be turned back by any living being in the world not even by god devenava not even by mara or by satan marenava so the next so this uh, so the wheel of the dhamma indicates how buddhism is a missionary religion because he said in most that is uh, the uh, the very first discourse there you find the missionary uh, act in the buddha is the first, that's the initial stage yes the second and the third settings in motion of the wheel of the dhamma one school of mahayana buddhism says that the wheel of the dhamma was set in motion not once as some believe but thrice this is a symbolic and emphatic way of saying how what the buddha taught gave rise in the course of time to three major doctrinal interpretations uh, i use these words i am subject to correction the dhamma realism of early buddhist schools the doctrine of emptiness of the madhyamaka and the doctrine of mind only of the vijnanavada next the fourth setting in motion of the wheel of the dhamma there's a the, for the fourth time some modern scholars of buddhism go further than even the mahayana they proclaim that the wheel of the dhamma came to be set in motion for a fourth time as well this time at the turn of the 19th century of the common era what they mean by this is the unprecedented awakening in buddhist studies that swept across the three continents of asia europe and america during and after the 19th century what led to this situation is the discovery we use the word discovery in a qualified sense of the literary sources of the three great buddhist traditions in the continent of asia theravada mahayana and vajrayana together with the discovery sometime later of the priceless buddhist manuscripts and artifacts of the lost civilization of central asia a civilization that lasted for thousand years this uh, thousands of manuscripts have been discovered from central asia actually buddhism went from india through central asia to china from china to korea from korea to japan so what we call pakistan afghanistan balochistan all these are buddhist kingdoms those days Uz- uzbekistan all these countries ending with star they are all buddhist countries yes so what what about emphasis is buddhism penetrated the whole of uh, asian continent peacefully peaceful penetration they never resorted to violence no is peaceful now when then there may have been some kind of tension but compared to speak it is extremely peaceful process now today buddhism is fast fading in the west that's also peacefully there's no question 
Yes, yes. yes. Epilogue. How many between Buddhism and other religions? As a fitting epilogue to what we have been saying so far on the issue of religious fundamentalism, we would like to draw your attention to two edicts issued by the Buddhist king Asoka of ancient India. In one edict issued in 2556 before the common era, King Asoka says, Beloved of the gods, King Piyadasi honors both ascetics and the householders of all religions, and he honors them with gifts and honors of various kinds. But the beloved of the gods, King Piyadasi, does not value gifts and honors so much as he values this that there should be growth in the essentials of all religions. Growth in essentials can be done in different ways, but all of them have as their root restraint in speech, very important, restraint in speech, that is not praising one's own religion, very important, not praising one's own religion or condemning the religions of others without good cause, that's correct. If there's a good cause, you can criticize, you, you must not be passive partners, if something is critical, but, and if there is cause for criticism, it should be done in a mild way, in a mild way, uh, by so doing, one's own religion benefits, and so do other religions, while doing otherwise, harms one's own religion, and the religions of others. Whoever praises his own religion, due to excessive devotion, and condemns others with the thought, let me glorify my own religion. He only harms his own religion. Therefore, cordial contact between religions is good. One should listen to and respect the doctrines professed by others. Beloved of the gods, King Piedasi desires that all should be well learned in the good doctrines of other religions. Here, Asok has laid down all the rules necessary for a religious dialogue. Now, today in, in the 20th, in the 21st century, there is a thing called the dialogue between religions, a dialogue between Buddhism and Islam. The, the, you know, this, the reason that this, this first professor of Sanskrit in the University of Oxford, he lived about 200 years ago, Professor Natchmuller, first professor, he is supposed to be the father of uh, Kampar religion. I think that title must go to Asoka. <laughs> because he, he, he initiated this combat religion. Uh, here you find how to conduct a beautiful dialogue between religions. Uh, let, let, one, one must not glorify one known religion, but still, if there are many mistakes, you have to point it out without condemning them. That all should be well learned in the good doctrines of other religions. Next one, yes. Harmony between Buddhism and other religions. Then this is continuing, yes, Asoka, this again the Asoka description. Those who are content with their own religion should be told this, Beloved of the gods, King Piyadasi does not value gifts and honors as much as he values that there should be growth in the essentials of all religions. And to this end, many are working. Dhamma Mahamatras, Mahamatras in charge of the women's quarters, officers in charge of outlying areas, and other such officers. And the fruit of this is that once all religion grows and the Dhamma is illuminated also. Yes. Next. Then we come to the last. Conquest by Dhamma is the supreme conquest. In another inscription, King Asoka says, Now, it is conquest by Dhamma that beloved of the gods considers to be the best conquest. And the conquest by Dhamma has been won here on the borders even 600 years away where the Greek king Antiochus rules. Beyond there where the four kings named Ptolemy, Antigonus, Magus and Alexander rule. Likewise, in the south, among the Cholas, the Pandyas, and as far as Tamrapani, Sri Lanka. Yes. 
here in the king's domain among the Greeks, the Cambodians. Cambodia is the word used by the Buddha as well as Asoka to refer to Persians, Iranians. Cambodia, not to Cambodia, not the present day Cambodia. Cambodia, Persia. Here in the king's domain among the Greeks, the Cambodians, the Nabakas, the Nabapantikas, the Bhojas, the Pitinikas, the Andras, and the Palidas, everywhere. People are following beloved of the gods instructions in Dhamma. Even where beloved of the gods envoys have not been, these people too, having heard of the practice of Dhamma and the ordinances and instructions in Dhamma given by the beloved of the gods, are following it and will continue to do so. This conquest has been won everywhere and it gives me great joy, the joy which only conquest by Dhamma can give. Asokan inscriptions is, are written in uh, Prakrit, very close to Pali. Those who know Pali can understand Asokan inscription. Very easy. Very easy. So, there are many, many inscriptions. Asokan inscriptions are, some of these Asokan inscriptions are in, 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 in Prakrit, some are in Greek, some are in, uh, some are in, uh, I forget the name, the mother tongue of Christ. I forget the name. Some are, there are in Afghanistan. There are two, uh, two in Afghanistan. There are two Asokan scripts. One in Greek, other in Aramaic. Aramaic is the mother tongue of Christ. Aramaic, Aramaic. So there are Asokan inscriptions not only in Prakrit but Greek and Aramaic. There are some Aramaic is interesting. You know Aramaic. Some Buddhist texts have been discovered in Afghanistan. But Afghanistan was earlier a uh, Buddhist country, where, uh, where Buddhists have used the Aramaic alphabet to write, Aramaic alphabet. So this should show that Buddhism penetrated even up to, up to, up to Palestine. There is no doubt about that. So, let's see. Yeah. Yes, uh, then this brings me to the end of my lecture today. So in concluding my speech, I would like to express thanks full great my, my grateful thanks to Mr. Leomka Chan and Mr. Leomka Tai, the two distinguished co-directors of Mama Charitable Foundation, whose generosity enabled me to share my knowledge of the Dhamma with, with the members of the audience. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. If there are any questions. Yeah. The professor would be happy to answer a few questions. Please raise your hand if you want to ask a question or have some sharing. Good Hello. Hello. Um, I'd like to ask about cultural pluralism that you mentioned. Yes. Cultural. Can you hear? Cultural pluralism. Yes. Uh, yes, and it's like uh, you mentioned that in uh, each country the culture is uh, like a framework for the Buddhist practices or beliefs in that culture, like like Japanese Buddhism, yeah. Thai Buddhism, etc. And then in America or in Hong Kong, there would be developed its own sort of uh, style of Buddhism. In that case, then, what is the actual essence of Buddhism that would be there without the cultural trappings? And actually, yes. in America, it's probably more um, concerned with Japanese or with um, Tibetan Buddhism. And I just wondered if you think there is actually a Buddhism that is um, like what what would be the word not connected so much with the culture? What is the actual essence of Buddhism itself? Could you say you have to separate Buddhism from Buddhist culture? They are two different things. The doc Buddhist doctrines are not the same as Buddhist culture. They are different. There are cultural variations. Now, 
you know, take Theravada. There are cultural variations in Tha- Thailand, Sri Lanka, Burma, they are all Theravada countries. In the same Theravada canon, the same Theravada doctrines, the same Theravada philosophy. But culture-wise, there are differences. Uh, it's about regional variations in Buddhist culture. That does not affect the doctrine. There are two different things. Uh, professor, uh, thank you for the lecture, and I want to uh, exploit the, your presence and your knowledge to ask you your personal opinion about uh, how do you think the Buddha uh, obtained or reached his uh, knowledge? I mean, uh, you think it's only through reasoning, or there can be, I don't say a divine uh, revelation or anything like that, but uh, I mean, uh, or, except for reasoning, there is a profound, uh, maybe meditative experience of life that from uh, an, ins- an intuition that comes from other part than pure reasoning or logical uh, thinking. Yes, your question is good. Buddhism does not recognize pure reasoning as a source of knowledge. Buddha has categorically rejected logic as a source of knowledge. But Buddhism recognizes logic to organize knowledge. Because what to say now must conform to what to say next. There must be a logical sequence in what to say. In the, that is a different matter. But as a source of knowledge, Buddhism, because the Buddha says what is based on logic can have four kinds of, it lends itself to four different interpretations. What is logically true can be well, log- well reasoned out. True, well reasoned out, false, not correctly reasoned out, still it can be accidentally right. It is not properly uh, reasoned out. The, 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 the comparison is also wrong. There's a, so, it's always em, through empirical observation. Buddhism is, now there are, you see, when it comes to knowledge, epistemology, there are two sources of knowledge. One is rationalism. Rationalism means those who believe in rationalism say all knowledge comes through pure reasoning. Uh, then uh, empiricism says no, all knowledge comes from empirical observation. I think if I am not a scientist, all scientific knowledge is empirical observation. Am I not right? Not all scientific theory, gravitation, all that are based on observation and verification. Therefore, the Buddha, Buddha has, he, 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 through sheer observation, all knowledge comes from observation. But, uh, I mean, uh, it's an observation that comes uh, uh, solely through a normal experience or can be like a, uh, also a meditative or... Yes, it's meditative. Because uh, when a mind is, uh, as I said, poisoned by the three poisons, you can't get good, not good uh, conclusion. You must, there's a moral foundation for, for you to get good knowledge. If a man is hateful, he cannot. If a man is greedy, he cannot. First, we have to, we have to be free from the three poisons. Hate, greed, hatred and delusion. Then only the truth will come. So there's a moral dimension to wisdom. So, the ultimate knowledge, it is not knowledge, it is wisdom. It is not knowledge, it is wisdom. Even an illiterate person can be wiser than a literate person. You see? What I want to say, an illiterate person can be wiser than a literate person. So, with knowledge, they say knowledge grows five times every year, but <laughs> not, not wisdom. It doesn't grow like that. Uh, one last thing. Uh, uh, what is, uh, because I think I'm not uh, a studies of Buddhism, I study economics, so I not really not go on about anything. To find a more reliable source of uh, Buddha's own teachings, uh, 
what textbook can one look? Because I think that he has not written anything. It's all uh, transcripted by others. Right? Actually, uh, uh, the Pali sources and their corresponding Chinese agamas, they are the earliest. The Pali Nikayas and the Chinese agamas, they are the earliest phase. There's no doubt about that. Uh, actually, what the Buddhist criteria of truth or, or, or the way to emancipation is not textual, pragmatic. The Buddha says, uh, freedom means the cessation of greed, hatred and delusion. What leads to the cessation of these three is good. What leads away from the, what, no, what leads to the cessation of greed, hatred and aversion is what the Buddha taught. What leads away from it is not what the Buddha taught. So very easy to remember that. If you know these three, empirically observe, we know by experience, authority of self-experience, which I said is the first, my first thing. By, by experience we know greed, hatred and delusion are inhibiting factors, conditioning factors. Actually, the Buddha defined them as Pamanakarana. The Buddha uses these three factors as Pamanakarana. They, are, they circumscribe our freedom. They limit. Pamanakarana means limiting factors. Limiting. Constricting factors. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you, Professor, for your lecture. Uh, I would like to, to ask about the uh, anger Buddhist pluralism. Because, in my view, uh, pluralism is also opinion. Pluralism is also? It's also opinion. All our opinions. It it's also opinion. It's also view. Pluralism. No, it's an occurrence. Pluralism is not an occurrence. It happens. It's a happening, not a view. Yes. Uh, pluralism uh, is a happening. Happen. When there are many things happen, you call it pluralism. pluralism. Yeah, but it's very interesting because in the, in the beginning of, of your lecture, uh, for, in my view, uh, you, you let attention about the the attachment to the opinion. But I got my opinion. See, attachment, all attachment to all opinion. Atta all attachment to opinion. All yeah. clinging to that's opinion. Right, that's right, that's right, that's right. To, this is a, a, a very important issue. Yeah. So. Because attachment to views is also greed. Just like attachment to things. Yeah. It also, you uh, pay attention to the metaphysical or metaphysical opinion. Yes, physical objects, yes. If, uh, if you include, include all opinion, it's also opinion. No, it's no. Also, no, these views I have. Attachment uh, one, opinion. one minute, I won't talk. By view, but the Buddha does not mean ordinary views. They are very necessary. But metaphysical theoretical views. Did the Pali word did to mean not ordinary views? We all have to live with, with views. My view of the Buddha, these are very mundane, uh, very innocent things. Ditti, the Pali word Ditti stands for metaphysical theoretical views, not ordinary views. So, Buddhism is a view, but it is a view to get rid of itself. Inclusive. Inclusive. Yeah. One day, uh, 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 the, the famous wandering philosopher, he is called Vachagut. He came to the, he is a very, very inquisitive, he is like Socrates. Going from place to place, challenging. Vachagotta is also came from place to place, went from place, and came to the Buddha and said, Venerable good Gautama, do you have any view? I'm repeating what I said. Then Buddha said, I have no views. Because I have viewed things as they truly are. The second time I'm repeating this, but it's very important. Dittinja Anupagatan. Dittanja, very beautiful. Dittanja Tathagatena. It was seen by the Buddha, but not grasped by the Buddha. You can see things without grasping. A view, 
you require a view when you have not understood the thing fully. If you know the thing fully, I don't have any view about it. View is the perspective, the way you look at it. The way you look at it. Thousand people can look at a thing a thousand ways. Different perspective. But without any perspective, if you look at it, then that is the correct position. Oh, thank you very much. So Thank you, Professor, for the talk. And on a similar sort of a talk, I heard the what it means is that one of the problems for the fundamentalism is that the other religions talk about the faith. 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 F A T E. Yeah. No, not faith. F A T H. Faith. Yeah. Whereas the Buddhism is a, the, the word sadha has been translated as faith. So. When they think of faith, that is why they become fundamentals. Whereas the Buddhism, the faith is not there. I wonder no. they would like to reflect. In Buddhism, uh, we find there are two. Buddha refers to two kinds of faith. One is amulika sadha, groundless faith. That is blind, blind faith. Amulika sadha, blind faith. Other is akaravati sadha, rational faith. Rational faith means. Now imagine. Now if I if I am ill, if I want to go to a doctor, I will examine the kind of doctor who is suitable for me. He has cured, cured so and so without going rushing through to charlatans. I go to the genuine doctor by examining like that, like that by examining gradually, gradually. This because the dharma is ehi pasi kono. Come and see. The Buddha says the dharma is come and see. You come and see the dharma, then you gradually develop some kind of rational faith, which will be vindicated. Uh, when you achieve the goal, but the arahants don't have to have, they have no faith. They, they have understood fully. Faith is a means, but not, not the end. But sometimes, faith, sadha is used for self-confidence. The, now, Buddha went to the two teachers, Alara Kalam and Uddhakaram Putta, then he used the word sadha in that sense. If, uh, if Alara Kalam can do this, I also can do this. Sadha here. I, I also have self, that's self-confidence. Sadha stands for, sometimes for self-confidence. I wonder whether I have clarified your question. Fine, fine. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It means is that the other religions... Ah, the yes. Other yes. religions take faith in a different context. That's, you are correct. You are correct. You are correct. They, they are, they, they, you have to, you have to, uh, that is absolute faith is necessary. Absolute faith. What is what is what is now? If a religious text says you accept it as it is, there is gospel truth. But not in Buddhism. Not in Buddhism. You don't have to. Sorry, one more question here. The, I read in the news recently. I've heard that the so-called Buddhist groups are fighting and destroying Muslim property in Myanmar, Burma, and also I think in Sri Lanka there was some fighting going on between so-called Buddhists and other groups, maybe Hindus or some other group. And how does that fit into Buddhist, uh, you know, tolerance and accepting the others? Is it like just getting too much part of the social structure or something like that? Or how would you explain yes, that? Yes, I think this is uh, Western propaganda. Now, you see, I'll get you. <laughs> now, now the, the Americans go and fight in, 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 where? in Afghanistan. Americans are 90% Christians. The Afghan, Afghans are 90% Hindus. The, no, why don't you call the Christian uh, fighting the Jews, uh, Muslims? They never say. They say the American soldiers are fighting. We will say it's the American Christians who are fighting against the. In Sri Lanka, the government forces fought. The, it was not a war between Hinduism and. Please remember, it was not a war between Hinduism and Buddhism. The, it was a. A minority of groups took to arms and for, they would have a separate province. So that has nothing to do with the religion. Buddhism and uh, Hinduism, very cordial relations in Sri Lanka. What about Burma? Burma, of course, very recently I hear there was some clash. We, we don't know who is responsible. I mean, Buddhists are not saints. I am not saying Buddhists will be keep it like this. When they, they, they are, they can't do that. They also have to uh, activate. 
because they are laymen, they are not enlightened, they are not Buddhas, they are not Arahants. We are in the samsara. Even Buddha says, Buddha does not show woe is bad. There's a justifiable woe. When a marauder, uh, marauder, uh, barbarians come to destroy one country, we, we have to fight back. This Burma problem between Muslims and uh, yeah, I, I have heard of, I, I read that in the newspapers. What are Bangladesh? In, in Bangladesh, these are the number of Buddhist. Uh, Buddhist, uh, Buddhist monasteries were destroyed completely. Large number, of, complete gutted out with fire in Bangladesh. Then what about the destruction of the in Afghanistan the Bamiyan Buddha? Any question? Sure. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Professor, what about psychology of uh, ideology? Yes, that's a very interesting subject. Yeah. Because you, even if I'll, I'll get to, I'll give you an example of Theravada Abhidhamma. According to Theravada Abhidhamma, a mind basically motivated by greed gives rise to wrong views. A mind basically motivated by hatred, no. Because a mind which is basically uh, motivated by hatred cannot judge it. To, to have a view, you must have a judge. You have to judge. You cannot judge. When you are angry, you cannot judge. When you are burning with hatred, you cannot judge. Then delusion. When you are deluded also, you can't judge. Delusion. You are deluded. Greed. Greed is the cause of all wrong theoretical views. This, this, is, this agrees with what the Buddha says in the Brahma Jala Sutra. All, that is precisely why. Have you noticed that there are thousands of superstitious views today, beliefs? Why don't they disappear? Well, the cause of the, uh, this is greed. If they are due to ignorance, that ignorance can be rectified. That is why this stick to the, even we will do that. When you are in danger, we are in, although I say this, when I am in vital danger, I can cling to anything. It is easy to say this, but difficult to practice. That is human nature. This is a very important issue. I mean. I haven't seen a little study about no, this, this psychology of uh, ideologies you find only in Buddhism, nowhere, not even in modern philosophy, as to the best of my knowledge. It is something distinctly Buddhistic, the psychology of... Now, yes, all due to psychological reasons. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, if we have no more questions, uh, before the lecture ends, uh, the director of the Mama Turtle Foundation, Mr. Lanka Chan, would like to say a few words for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on behalf of Mama Turtle Foundation, I would like to thank Professor Karina Dasa uh, uh, for giving us the series of inaugural uh, visiting professor lectures. Uh, and also, I would like to thank Venerable King Hong and <laughs> Professor Li Chafan um, to put all this together. And uh, thank you, Professor Karina Dasa. I hope to see you all in the next series of uh, Monitor Temple Foundation uh, is in Professor Lectures. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Studies, I also would like to thank uh, the uh, Professor Conrad Daza for his very enlightening lectures and also the Mama Foundation, uh, represented by the Mr. Lerns, uh, to give us this opportunity to gather together to learn from the Professor and learn from the Buddha. 
and uh, we will certainly we will have again next year, either in the fall terms or spring terms, we will have another uh, extinguished professor to come and speak to us. So looking forward to see you again next time. Thank you very much.